morning. <laughs> all right, mic check. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. One, two, three. One, two, three. Great. Well, good to see you all. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, before we get too far into it, just to confirm, today is graduate Sunday, right? And so our, we have our new, some new graduates that are joining us for worship this morning. And also just to confirm, today's Father's Day, 
right? No, I'm just kidding, I know it's about to say. But if you're a graduate, or if you're a father, do you mind just uh, standing up real quick so that we can celebrate you and, and welcome you and you know, praise God for you? So if you just welcome them. Thank you. Great. We're jumping back into Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, that you would go to Matthew chapter 2. In the seminary, one of my professors said, uh, you know, that how are you going to navigate holidays? And are you going to do specific topical sermons? And he mentioned that I might, we might take it like this, where with the Father's blessing that they all love Jesus this morning, with your permission, we would love to keep going in our gospel and study the book of Matthew this morning. And even our first-time graduates who are joining us, with your permission as well, uh, I would like to continue going in the book of Matthew. But uh, if you see them around church this morning, or obviously uh, to your own fathers, uh, just celebrate them, uh, you know, pray for them, pray over them. But for us, we will continue uh, going on in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Okay. If you don't mind, I would love to pray for us before we get started. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for this day. Lord, even thank you for uh, just the reasons for celebration and joy today that you have allowed us to have. Uh, Lord, we pray, God, that at this time you would speak to us clearly from your word. God, help us to refocus, to realign uh, our attentions this morning. Lord, whatever may have happened, wherever our hearts or our heads may be, Lord, at this time we want to come to you and to hear from you and to think about you and consider you. Uh, and Lord God, find you to be good. Lord, would you be our living water this morning? Uh, would you be a reason for us to celebrate and have joy and have peace this morning and speak to us clearly from your word? Lord, we love you and we pray all of this in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, we are continuing through our Matthew series. And we are in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Today we're talking about promises, specifically the promises of Christ, the promises that are fulfilled through Christ, the promises that we still actively live in and live under today. Uh, and you know, an opening question I had for us is, have you ever had to wait for a promise to come true in your life, if you think about it? Maybe someone even promised you something and it took a very long time until that promise came true. Maybe you even thought that that promise would never happen or that they had lied. I received my wife's permission to tell this story before I told it. But one moment that sticks out <laughs> embarrassingly in my mind was in middle school, the very first time that I asked a girl to be my girlfriend or I asked a girl out. And it was right before uh, school let out for winter break, and I had got this cute bunny plushie, and I met her at her locker, and I asked her, would you like to go out with me? And it took a lot of courage, and it was the first time I had ever done something like this, and she said, <laughs> she said, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I will let you know. And I was like, okay, all right, that's not a no, I guess. And so we said goodbye and we went home and you know, winter break is about a week. And she said that she was going snowboarding with her friends and she said that she would let me know. She said she would email me, right? Back then, I don't know if I'm dating myself, right? But emailing was, you know, it was a little pre-smartphones and texting and even all of that. So she said that she would email me. So for the entire winter break, I sat in front of my computer, refreshing the page for an email that I was promised, <laughs> but an email that never came. 
and she completely forgot to email me. And ultimately, I was a little heartbroken at the time, you know, but it was seventh grade. I, I bounced back pretty quick. Uh, and she's one of my closest friends uh, to this day. She's like a sister to me. And uh, we just love and care for each other very well. And, but in the moment, I was broken. And in the moment, I was really sad even because I was waiting for an email that was promised to me, but never came. Uh, today we'll see in scripture that when our God promises something, he is faithful to always carry it out, to finish it, and to make sure his promise comes true. Our God uh, will always carry out and fulfill his promises to us. We can count on that. We can rest on that. We'll see it through the early days of Christ as we continue on. Uh, relatively soon after his birth narrative, how Christ himself fulfilled every promise and prophecy and requirement that was about him, the Savior King. Okay? So if you have, if you're taking notes this morning, uh, here is our main idea. If you take nothing else home this morning, I pray that this will be helpful to you even as you leave this place, and this is it. Through Christ, through Jesus Christ, we are able to see and trust that God keeps his promises. Okay. Through Christ, our King and Savior, we are able to see and trust that God keeps his promises. Right. And you see this in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. So look along in your Bibles. I'll read out loud for us. Just follow along where you are. This is Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, the flight to Egypt. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. In case you're a little bit lost, just to give you some context, uh, where we were, where we left off in Matthew 2 was uh, the wise men came to worship and offer gifts and, and to, uh, to travel the long distance, sacrifice precious material gifts and possessions to Jesus, the king of the world, the universe that was born. And so here we are seeing the, them leaving and Joseph and Mary and Jesus are being told by the angel of the Lord here. Uh, the angel is telling Joseph in verse 13, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, because Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Verse 14, and so Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Verse 15 is really important, the way that it ends there. Take note of that. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Continue on in verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and he killed all of the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. And lastly, verses 19 through 23. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared again in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Through Christ, we are able to see and trust that God keeps his promises. Do you live aware of God's promises for your life? Do we even know God's promises for our lives? Do we really trust God all the time that his promises and his plans are good for our life? Do we trust the timing of his promises? Why do we so often try to take things into our own hands and get things done when God is working and he always has been working and will always be working? Through Jesus Christ, we're able to see and we are able to trust that God keeps his promises. I think the first way that you see this is in verses 13 through 15. You see God is promising, God is fulfilling his promises in and despite our struggles. Okay? 
So the first point, God is fulfilling his promises in and despite our struggles. You see, as soon as the wise men leave, in verse 13, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him to rise and flee to Egypt. So a little bit of context here. I don't know how familiar with uh, ancient Near Eastern geography everyone is in the room, but how far is Egypt where the angel is talking to Joseph here? About 64.34 miles if you don't account for terrain, which there's a lot of terrain in ancient Israel. And so if you just do a straight distance, a straight shot to the border of Egypt, it's about 64.34 miles. Does anyone know how fast an, or like what the average human walking speed is? Yeah, I'm sure some like fitness people know, but about an average that I found was about three miles an hour, okay? So about three miles an hour is the average human walking speed. So one mile takes about 20 minutes to walk. You can agree or disagree with that as you will. Uh, so if a human, average human walked straight to Egypt from where Joseph is being called to Egypt, because back then there was no cars, there's no airplanes. Uh, if they were lucky, they had camels. Uh, otherwise, they walked on, on foot. And so it would be about over 20 hours of a trip. So imagine walking for 20 hours. It would be a many day trip. It would be a hard and difficult trip. Furthermore, the angel says, remain there until I tell you, how long is that? Imagine being Joseph, where in hindsight, we can know that Herod dies in anywhere between a year or two, but imagine being called to go to a far off place to take your newborn baby to take your new family and not knowing when you can go back home to your country, to the place that you're familiar with. Herod is going to search and destroy. And so Joseph is thinking that, well, if we stay, then our child will die. And so this is a tough spot that Joseph and his family find themselves in shortly after Jesus is born. But look at what happens immediately in verse 13. Joseph rises and takes his family by night and goes to Egypt until Herod dies. We can notice immediate obedience, even in the midst of a crazy commandment that makes no sense and seems extremely difficult. And as you finish up in verse 15, look at what, this, look at what happens. This is all to fulfill prophecy, that it all goes to plan according to God's will, that he was in control from the beginning. This prophecy is actually from Hosea way back in the Old Testament. And so Joseph's family's trip to Egypt, his time in Egypt and his return to Israel is all, are all ways that the Lord is still fulfilling and working his promises. That out of Egypt, I called my son. Even in the midst of a, a struggle and suffering and a hard time, Joseph is still able to cling and hang on to God's promises and even his goodness and who he is and to give up control. For me, it makes me think about uh, where I, I really like to drive and I like to go fast, but you know, obeying the law, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and I, I just like uh, cars. And especially when I was younger, I didn't, uh, our family didn't have the most financial capabilities growing up, so I always drove my parents' cars or whatever used cars we had or what were able to procure. Uh, and, you know, I drove my mom's minivan for a while, and I was rocking my, min my mom's minivan in high school and driving it around. Uh, and sometime in college, I, I, I think I mentioned this when I first came to preach, but I had received my current car as a gift from my friend's parents who were devoted church members and they knew that I needed a car because I had recently gotten into an accident and totaled my previous car. And so uh, they, they knew that I was ministry oriented and so they wanted to help support me. And so they gave me uh, my friend's new, new old car. And so it had less than like 30,000 miles. It was a huge blessing. It was a 2013 model at 2017. And maybe you guys are used to get driving 2023 cars in 2022. But for me, I was used to driving 2,000 cars in 2010. And so this was a big deal, right? My car had Bluetooth. That, that was huge. I don't have to use a little cassette 
to plug into my aux. Now phones don't even have aux cables. Uh, but I remember when I got this car, I was so happy. And then as soon as I got it, my dad asked me, he said, Johan, <laughs> he said, John, I need to ask you something. I said, it better not be about my new car. And he said, our finances are a little struggling right now. So is it okay if I take your car so that I can Uber with it? Because our other cars are too old and Uber requires newer cars. So he was trying to you know, make some money and help keep our family alive. And so he asked if he could appropriate <laughs> my, my new car. And I just remember in that moment, I was so broken. I was like, God, why would you give me this new car and, and this amazing car with Bluetooth? And it's a sedan, I don't have to drive a, a minivan anymore. And it made no sense, it was incredibly hard. Why give me a car just to take it away? But <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna not give it to my dad. So I gave it to my dad and, and he used it to drive for Uber. And so for about the first year, year and a half that I had this new car, I wasn't able to drive it at all uh, because he was using a majority of the time for work. I got it back after a few years, but eventually we got through some of those financial difficulties uh, and my dad used it to work. And I just remember in that moment that it was so hard for me to escape my struggles that was happening and trust in a God who still had a good plan and whose promises were still being fulfilled in my life and my dad's life and around us. And so uh, th that's true in Christ's life and that's true in our lives. I mean, imagine God talking with Jesus before coming to earth. That he says, rise and go to earth, be born as a helpless baby, live a perfect and holy life while struggling and suffering and being tempted, die a sinner's terrible death by the cross, be betrayed by your closest friends and your loved ones, be mocked and disrespected and hated, but we know that Jesus did it all. None of it makes any sense, really. None of it made any sense. But he did it all knowing that God was in control. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was surrendering to God's plan and said, Lord, if there is any way that I can escape the coming cross, help me. But ultimately, the, the Lord, our Lord says, but not my will, but your will be done. And he goes and he obeys the Father up until the cross and he surrenders. And so we know that he is the promised and prophesied savior and he went ahead of us even in hard times and he still clung to and prioritized God's commandments and his promises. In hard times, in difficult times, if and when God is calling you to do something that might make no sense or it might seem very tough or awful, I pray that you would obey God's calling. Trust that he is in control and trust that he has a plan. Trust in his many promises and know that he is a God who keeps his promises to his people and his children. Through Jesus Christ, we're able to see and trust that God keeps his promises, even his birth as they flee to Egypt. And the second point that we see is in verses 16 through 18. And the second point this morning is this. The brokenness that we see around us does not change God's promises. The brokenness that we see around us is not reflective of a God who has abandoned us or is it reflective of a God who has ceased to work in our lives. Look in verses 16 through 18. Where Herod, seeing that he was being tricked by the wise men, becomes furious and sends and kills all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were two years old or under because he knew from the wise men that this king of kings was supposed to be born. Herod kills all of the male children in Bethlehem and imagine being the mother or the father even as we think about Father's Day this morning or the sister or brother when this is happening everywhere. To be living in this time and place where Herod is killing all of the baby boys, the biggest question would be why? Why is this happening? Both to Herod and to God, everywhere you look, there might be pain and suffering, injustice and evil. Why is this awful, horrible thing happening? Does this horrible event on the earth mean that God has lost control or is an unfaithful God? By no means. Even this hardship was to fulfill prophecy, a promise that this evil would happen, but our God would work despite of it for good and that he would redeem it, that our God is a redeemer. He takes the brokenness and brings beauty out of it. Out of ashes, he builds beauty. 
And this is true about our God. God took Herod's evil act and sin. He prophesied about it through Jeremiah, as is written here, and turns it into something good. He saves Jesus from that death, and he would make a way for all to live in the future through his son, Jesus Christ. You only have to look around briefly and at the world today to see the brokenness of the world. You only have to look around briefly at your own life and see that things are not the way that they should be. When we see injustice and suffering in this world, North Korea, school shootings in the United States, it's appropriate for us to mourn and to grieve and to weep just like Jesus did and would. For us to fight for justice, for us to hate injustice, but above all, we're also called to remember who is on the throne above and who is in control over all things. That the Lord is still working and that he has not lost control. Uh, this was back in the 2016, 2020 election, but when Trump and Hillary were running against each other for uh, the presidency, uh, I remember that that was kind of one of my first political elections that I was seeing a lot of my friends or people around us uh, really start to pour out their opinions on social media and to verbalize it and to talk about it. And there was just negative emotions everywhere. And there were just people on both sides just yelling at each other and saying bad things about each other and just you know, smearing each other's name. And there was just a lot of wildness going on. And I remember when I was noticing and thinking about these things at the time that some people I think we're tempted to, see, to maybe get too absorbed in the earthly situations and forget that we had a God on the throne. I'll never forget this. I, I wrote uh, at that time, and I, I wrote that uh, Trump is a child of God and is broken, but deserves to be loved. And I wrote Hillary is a child of God and is broken, but deserves to be loved. And these are biblical truths and biblical promises to us. And I remember putting that, and when my friends saw it, and when my friends heard about it, and they said, uh, John, thanks, thanks for this. It, it helped for me to cool my head. Uh, it, it was good for me to come back and think about what is true, and, and to not just get absorbed in the brokenness and the struggling and everything that is going on around us. There's always hope, despite what it may seem like. There always is a plan. There is always victory. There will be a day when our God will punish, where he will judge. There will also be a day where our God will heal, and he will make all things new. There's no better example of this, uh, of where brokenness that we see around us does not change God's promises than when Jesus himself was on the cross that all hope seemed to be lost, that evil had seemed to win. Everywhere you looked, evil was winning and there was suffering. Rome had won, the Pharisees and the religious elite had won. Why was this awful, horrible thing happening to someone who was walking around helping the lame to walk, the blind to see, and the mute to speak? But three days later, we know that Jesus defeated death and claimed everlasting life and all power. What could be worse in this world than Christ hanging from a cross, mocked, whipped, but also holy and blameless, undeserving of any punishment, bleeding out and dying? But even the cross was turned into good. What could we possibly fear and lose our minds worrying or being anxious about? We believe in a God who works and is faithful despite the brokenness around us. He is stronger and bigger than the brokenness. Know that evil never wins, even when it seems like it does. The battle might be lost, and there might be temporary pain, but the war has already been won. Jesus clearly says, it is finished. There's not a single thing that can happen to you or anyone that is outside of God's promises and plans. Even in the worst possible situation and circumstance, know that God is always in control and that he is still working, just like he was working through the life and the promises and prophecies of Christ. Through Christ, we're able to see and trust that God is a promise keeper. And our last point as we wrap up this morning, look, uh, in verses 19 through the end of Matthew 2. The third point is this, that God's promises don't always align with our expectations. Okay? God's promises do not always align with our expectations. 
In verse 19, Herod dies. And so an angel appears of the Lord to talk to Joseph and say, rise, go back to Israel because those who sought the child's life are dead. Herod dies, Archelaus, his son, rules and is still a terrible king. So Joseph intentionally takes his family not to Judea, but where? To Galilee. Galilee was full of fishermen in this Roman era, normal people doing normal, dirty, boring work. The nine to five of Jesus' day. Uh, the city is called Nazareth. Uh, if you think about Nazareth, it's kind of like, think about like a hick city. Uh, I'm newer to Maryland, so I don't know if there's any country places in Maryland or like backwater towns, right, like to, for lack of a better term. But that's kind of the uh, thought process and the, the way that they considered and thought about Nazareth back in the time. It wasn't Washington, D.C., it wasn't Chicago, it wasn't Dallas or L.A. Imagine country folk, uh, people who might usually be looked down upon. Can anything can anyone good come out of Nazareth? That's what Philip says in John 1:46 when he's told that Jesus is from Nazareth himself. Nazareth is boring, it's not exciting. It's looked down upon and judged by people. But God took this place and he chose to fulfill his prophecy and promise through it, through Jesus. And he had Jesus right where he wanted him, the son of a carpenter and also a carpenter, a simple carpenter himself. For me, I always liked home. Uh, growing up in Northern Virginia, I always liked to just be at home and the simple, the casual, the peaceful, that was kind of always my vibe. Uh, but my friends, they always wanted to go far from home. They wanted to change things up. They wanted exciting things. And eventually, once I got a little bit into college, I went to school at a community college near home. Uh, it was pretty simple. It was uneventful. After a certain amount of time, even I started to get a little bored and restless. Uh, and I really, I found myself saying and thinking, God is really all that you want from me right now to just go to church, uh, serve at church, work part-time, and do school, excuse me, commuting from my house. But over time, God showed me that I was exactly where I needed to be. I found myself questioning the Lord and in the mundane and the boring that I was going through and saying, Lord, are you still working here? Is this where you want me? And at, at God still showed me that I was exactly where I needed to be. Uh, there were so many opportunities and so many chances and, and so many uh, events that happened in my life as I was doing boring kind of day-by-day -day ministry in this area in college. And the Lord was still working in my life and showing me uh, just one very quickly. Uh, one of my friends at community college, he wasn't Christian, but one day I invited him to, to come to church with me. And he came to church with me and he sat in Bible study. He had fun. He had a good time. And then uh, I drove him back home. And after I drove him home, he, he was about to leave the car. And he said, John, I want to talk to you about the gospel. I want to talk to you about what we heard tonight. And I was like, great. I was like, awesome. And so for about four hours, I drove him home at around 10 p.m., 11 p.m., and he basically held me captive in my car for three to four hours, and he just talked to me about Jesus, and he talked to me about the church and the things that he had heard and wanting to believe. Ultimately, he didn't give his life to Christ at that very moment, but the Lord showed me through something like that that I was exactly where he wanted me to be. All of the different ministries that I was in and grew me in, my church, my mentor, I wouldn't trade any of it ever. In college, I fell about a year and a half behind in community college. Uh, we familiarly, fondly <laughs> refer to it as like the community college trap, right? Because you kind of get comfortable, you have a part-time job, so you're making money, and so you don't take your studies very seriously. So I was trying to retake some classes. I didn't do very well as a first-time college student. And so I fell about a year and a half behind uh, taking classes at community college and in my college career. And when I came down to North Carolina and went to seminary there and I plugged into my first local church there, I remember meeting with this older brother, his name was Jeff, and uh, Jeff asked if I wanted to go out and get to know each other. And so we went and got burgers and we were talking and I was just telling him about my life and my, uh, so far my ministry experience and what the Lord has been doing in my life and especially as I was growing up in Northern Virginia. And I remember sharing my testimony with him. Uh, and I was, I was saying that I, I felt like back then, uh, when I was sharing with him, I, I, was, I felt like I had lost time. That I said, Jeff, I, I spent about a year and a half and I feel like I, I just wasted so much time that I just took one class in that semester. I worked five days a week at a, at a cafe where I just you know, bagged and wrapped sandwiches and called numbers and I went to church and uh, I just feel like the Lord didn't really do anything exciting or you know, I felt like to me, 
back then that I had wasted that time. And I will never forget how Jeff responded to me. He was so serious. And he, he stayed serious the whole time I knew him. But he was so serious. And he said, he said, John, don't ever say that. And I was floored. I was like, uh, first of all, I don't know this guy. <laughs> so why is he talking like that to me? But I was floored. And he said, he said John, don't say that. You, you don't know that, that God does everything perfectly, that he had you exactly where he wanted you when he wanted you to be there. That even if, there was, if that year and a half of what you think was boring and mundane, if that had never happened, John, where would you be now? Who knows where you would be? But the Lord does know, and his plan and his promises are perfect and always faithful. And so I hope that even when things around us might seem uh, counter to our expectations, that God's promises might not always align with our expectations, that we would still trust in him and put our faith in him and his promises. This was Christ even. He was the carpenter. His team of tax collectors and fishermen and everyday normal people were his disciples, his apostles. He tended to the lonely, the lost, the crippled, the handicapped, the blind, the muted. He mingled with the common people. He was a common person as well on the street. He rode donkeys in the houses. He went in the houses and he spent time with people. In the boring and the mundane, the savior king of the world chose to live and to do his ministry. Try to wrap your mind around that. That the king of the universe who spoke and galaxies came into existence, he chose to live and do his ministry in the boring and the mundane. It was all according to his desire, his plan, his prophecy and promises. He knew exactly who would listen to him, who needed him and where he had to be found. Wherever you are in whatever season you are, know that God has not abandoned you. Ask and seek his face on why you are there and be open to what he reveals to you. I hope and pray that you would seek contentment and peace with your position, your place, your situation. Try to thrive and to make the most of wherever and whenever you are and do the most that you can for Christ, no matter where you are, knowing that he sees you. He's gone before you and done it all and he is still in control and you are not forgotten. Through Christ, we're able to see and trust that God keeps his promises. So as we close, just some conclusions and exhortations for you this morning. I pray that you would know Christ. Grow in your knowledge of the man and the God that we worship. So know Christ more. And also know the promises that he fulfilled to know just how God he really is. If you think and know more about the prophecies and promises that Jesus fulfilled, you can see just how God he really is, just how much he really was who he says he was. I also pray that you would know Jesus' promises to you. This entire sermon will make no sense if you don't know his promises. You will never know rest and peace in his promises until you know what those promises are. You need a knowledge of what he says. You need to dive into the word and examine and hold closely and treasure and memorize the promises that God makes in your life that he is still working in your life, even this day to unfold. And that will help you to not lose your head. That will help you to trust in him and not be intimidated or misaligned by the things that are going on around you. Some example promises just for you to take with you. Isaiah 41, God says, do not be afraid, I am with you. I am your God, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Psalm 37, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall because the Lord upholds him with his hand. Finally, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 29. We'll get there as a little sneak peek for you this morning. Hear the words of our Savior to you this morning. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Those are the promises of your King to you this morning. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time. Lord, thank you for this word. Uh, Lord, thank you for being a God of promises. Thank you for being a God that we can trust. 
Lord, thank you for being a God who has outlined your promises. God, you don't send us into the grocery store uh, not telling us what to get, but Lord, you tell us exactly in your word, in your Bible, in your scripture, how we are to live our lives, the promises that we can place our full trust and our full faith in, Lord, for this life as we walk it day by day. God, help us to not uh, be thrown off by the things that are going on around us. Help us to think properly about our lives in reflection of the promises that you give to us. Lord, thank you for being a faithful God. Thank you for being someone who loves us, a God who is close to us, Emmanuel, God with us. And so, Lord, I pray as you leave this place that you remind us of your promises again and help us to cling to them, give us a greater knowledge and a thirst for them as we go forth from this place. We love you. Thank you for loving us. I pray all of this in your son's precious name.
You are a God who is so good to us, and you are a God who is perfect in all that you do in this world and in our lives. We thank you, Father, for loving us, for giving to us this life in the body of Christ. And we thank you, Father, that we know you because you have called us to be your own, and you are right here within our hearts. We pray, Father, that you will help us to love this world that we live in because you have loved us. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to keep all the promises that we have made to you and the people in our lives and reflect the righteousness of God. We make this prayer to you, Father, in the name of your Son. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Everyone, please be seated. We have just a few announcements for the church today. First announcement is today is Father's Day, as you know, and I just wanted to take a quick moment here to recognize all the fathers who are out there today and for all that you do for your families. I hope today is a blessed, uh, relaxing, and wholesome day for you where you can just spend some time with your children. So happy Father's Day to you, and may God's blessing be upon you. Uh, second announcement is that after the second KM worship, or during today's uh, second KM worship, it will actually be a sending worship for the Mexico missions team. The short-term missions team will be leaving at 4 a.m. on the 19th, and they will be returning on the 23rd. So please pray for the short-term missions team. Uh, next week, on June 25th, the church will be having a graduation party for the elementary, middle, and high school students. So everyone is invited. And last announcement is that there will be fellowship lunch today, and also fellowship lunch the week following. On July 2nd, we will not have to be having a fellowship lunch. Please let us conclude our worship today with the benediction. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you for joining us in worship.